Excuse me, the grace and mercy and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ this morning as we focus on stewardship for the next three Sundays. Today, I'd like to share with you some devotional thoughts that come out of the epistle of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Please join me now in a word of prayer. Father, once a year, O Lord, our church before puts before us an opportunity to reflect on our stewardship. We, O Lord, can look upon this as an opportunity to do not a gut check, but a heart check. To see where our heart is, to see where our treasure is, by the amount of things we are doing with our time, treasures, and talents, and how we proportion them out among ourselves and upon you, upon you and upon our neighbor. Help us, O Lord, to evaluate our stewardship in a godly light and to respond in accordance. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. For friends of Christ, there are two topics that have been talked about as being taboo in conversation. Of course, those are religion and politics. Now, the reason why these are taboo topics, I would go on to say, is that they have to deal with abstract concepts. There's a difference between abstract and concrete concepts. Abstract concepts have those things which cannot really be measured by the five senses. As a matter of fact, they use a big $12 word to talk about those concepts. Metaphysical. Meta is Greek, which means after or beyond. So abstract concepts are very difficult to necessarily communicate and even agree upon. Because there's no real way to measure them. Now, compare that to concrete objects. I can tell you that that desk measures 46 inches by 22 inches. You can't argue that. That's concrete. And so when we look at this topic of stewardship this week and next two Sundays, some may think, you know, the church should probably just kind of stay away from stewardship because it creates hard feelings. People don't feel comfortable and they get a little nervous about it. Well, that's because stewardship consists of both abstract and concrete objects. What is concrete about stewardship? You can actually look at what you're doing with your time and your treasures and talent. You can objectify, objectively measure these things. But where it gets abstract is when we begin to debate what is the proper ratio. How much of my time, treasure, and talent am I giving to my neighbor and the church and keeping for myself? And is that ratio proper? That's where it gets abstract. That's where it gets a little bit dicey. I'm talking about stewardship in that way. But the church would be amiss if it did not confront members about stewardship due to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, 21. Where your heart is, there will be your treasure also. So, concretely, look at what you're doing with your time, treasures, and talent, and ask yourself, where's your heart? These three things can help us determine where our heart and where our treasure is. So, stewardship is not really necessarily a gut check, it's a heart check of where our treasure truly is. Well, one thing to keep in mind as we present this topic of stewardship is to make sure we don't forget to include the gospel in it. It's so easy to talk about stewardship in a legal and lawful manner that we sometimes forget to bring in the gospel. It can happen sometimes when we preach about stewardship that the pastor may become like the servant Nathan who confronted David about his sin of adultery. He gave him that parable and he pointed the finger at David and said, You are the man! Sometimes when stewardship is preached with law, the pastor may be pointing his finger at the people and saying, You are the man. They forget that in this narrative with David, that if you look just a few verses after Nathan points his finger and says to David, you are the man, Nathan gives him the gospel. He says to David, the Lord has taken away your sin. So in preaching about anything in the church, 
The law and the gospel must be properly balanced in order to fully preach the counsel of God. Now, one place where apparently stewardship was being effectively preached was in the province of Macedonia. Macedonia was just a little bit north of Corinth, of which Paul was addressing this letter. And they were taking off in the faith. And they were taking off in their stewardship. And St. Paul uses the people of Macedonia to encourage the people at Corinth in the south to increase their stewardship. They're giving to their time, treasures, and talents. What was Macedonia doing so differently than what was going on in Corinth? Well, you heard it in the epistle today. They were giving generously, sacrificially, liberally. And what Paul says amazes him is they were giving it during a time of extreme poverty. They were giving generously in times of severe tribulation and trial. It's like, what in the world? That doesn't seem normal. That doesn't seem natural. Even St. Paul in the narrative communicates, you guys are giving too much. Slow it down. But the gospel of Jesus Christ said, no, we're not going to slow it down. We want to participate in the honor of giving to the saints in Jerusalem. Understand that. They call it an honor, not an obligation. Obligation is law. Honor is gospel. They wanted to have the honor of sharing in the needs of the saints of Jerusalem. So what is going on in Jerusalem at this time? It's not that they need to build the temple. The Christian church is not really concerned about the temple. They've got Jesus Christ. They're concerned about the temple in heaven. So what's going on with the Christian saints in Jerusalem is they were experiencing extreme poverty of a famine. They were struggling to put food on the table. And Paul, in his ministry, went out among all the churches he visited and asked if they would consider giving to the needs of the saints in Jerusalem. So the people at Macedonia were just moved by the gospel of Jesus Christ to say, how can we help? Even though we have got poverty on our side and we're experiencing tribulation, we want to give and be part of the honor of supporting the saints in Jerusalem. St. Paul says it was amazing because they first gave themselves to God, then they gave themselves to Paul, and then they asked Paul, what do we do? Paul shared the need, and then they gave themselves to the saints in Jerusalem to take care and alleviate the needs, their physical needs. It is amazing what's happened in Macedonia. St. Paul puts that before us and before the people at Corinth. He says this to the people at Corinth. He says, I would like you to pray for that gift of giving. Think about what Paul was saying. He's communicating that you can have as much grace about giving as there is to be happy. There is no limit. You know, St. Paul kind of says the same thing about the fruits of the Spirit. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, self-control. Against there, these things, there is no law. It means you can have as much as you want. There's no limit. So therefore you go back to the same thing here with the grace of giving. Paul says you can have as much as you want in the grace of giving. There is no limit. Just pray for it. He said, you know, you people at Corinth, you pride yourself on all the gifts of grace you have, knowledge, you got this great gift of discretion and ability of speech, and you got the great gift of diligence. You guys want to brag about all that? Why don't you start bragging about giving the grace of giving? So what holds us back? for praying for that grace. Think about it. What holds you back from praying about that grace? I think it's <coughs> concerned that we're going to have to change. You know what they're saying? Be careful what you pray for. You might get it, right? Imagine what it would mean in changing your life if you prayed for the grace of giving. But what that's going to do to you. Things could be altered. But that's what Jesus asks us to do in heart checks. Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. We take a look at how God has graced us with salvation. St. Paul uses an economic metaphor, does he not? 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, he says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through him might become rich. Paul, in this narrative, stays true to his theme, talks about the grace of salvation with an economic metaphor. Jesus had it all. He empties all his riches, comes to this world, becomes poor and empties himself even of his life so that you and I might become rich with salvation. They say about grace, it's God's riches at Christ's expense. So how does this cross work? There's been discussion about the effect of the cross over the course of the church history. There's a guy by the name of Anselm. He lived about 1,100 A.D., bishop in England. And he communicated the message that the cross works by Jesus taking the punishment for our sin. That we needed a cleansing. That Jesus experiences the wrath of God so that we don't have to. That sounds pretty much what our church body yet confesses. Jesus is punished for us by his laceration, by his whips. We are healed. He did, because we couldn't. There was a guy living at the same time of Anselm, and his name was Abelard. He was not a bishop, but he was a French Catholic philosopher. And he said he had problems with Anselm. There, you know why? Because it made God look bad. Oh, my Lord, Abelard would say, what you're promoting here is divine child abuse. God is punishing his son. What kind of a message is that? And then to say that we need this cleansing, how bad our sin is, that Jesus has got to do that for us? No, no, no. This makes God look bad. This makes man look bad. That's not the meaning of the cross. So Abelard said, all that mankind needed was not cleansing. He needed an attitude adjustment toward God. That's what he promoted. And so he said that when people look at the cross, they're going to be moved by love to respond. To Christ. God loved us, showed his love. When we see that love, we'll be morally influenced to love God and to love our neighbor. I know this is an old, old story that's a thousand years ago. But you know, it's still being played out today. Many of us are aware of this hymn called Christ Alone. There was a debate that just took place with the church body over this hymn. The church body wanted to include the hymn in their hymnal. But before they did, they wanted the phrase to be changed to an Avalon thing. Because the way it is originally written, it is said this way, in the cross, the wrath of God was satisfied. No, 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 we don't want to promote God like that, nor do we want to say human nature is that bad that we've got to have Jesus be punished for our sins. No, no, no. We need to do the Abelard thing. We need to change those words and say, in the cross, the love of God was magnified. See the difference? Catch it? Wrath of God was satisfied. Handsome. Love of God was magnified. Abelard. Things have not changed. The debate continues to go on. And so, when that church body presented to Getty, the other ones who wrote that hymn, and said, can we change it? They said, no. We're using the answer of theory here, and you're not going to change it. And in the end, the church body refused to include the hymnal because they did not want the answer of theory in their book. Just too hard, too difficult for human nature to accept the fact that we needed a cleansing of sin. But the truth of the matter is, couldn't they both be right? That in the cross, God's wrath was satisfied, and in the cross, God's wrath was magnified. But I guess the difficulty is how do you put all those verses and words in that hymn without getting a little messed up? But in, in the, the problem are both right. You know, there was a movie some years ago that kind of explains this truth of the Avalar theory. Just as much as important to understand that God's love is manifested to us and it can change us and move us. It was in the movie Frozen. 
And there was that battle between Elsa and Anna. Anna wanted to try to encourage Elsa to come back to the village, and Elsa said no, and then Elsa in her anger strikes Anna with that lightning bolt. And that lightning bolt hits her in the heart. Because of that, she's going to be frozen permanently over a process of time. Olaf, the snowman, hears that there's a cure to remove the curse. Remember what it is? A true act of love thaws the frozen heart. And in the very end of the movie, Olaf puts it together as Anna stands in between her sister and a sword that is to come upon her. She raises up her hand, she comes to a total frozen statue, she stops the sword, and at the end, she becomes unthought. And Olaf puts it all together again. Ah, oh, yes. A true act of love thaws an open heart. No more true act of love than the act of sacrifice. So Jesus does. By the cross of Jesus Christ, our hearts that are frozen with sin are thawed. And we, in response, can give generously. And St. Paul says that in this act of stewardship, of giving generously and sacrificially, a balance is worked in the Christian faith. But you see, the people in Jerusalem, their scale was built towards spiritual faith because their physical needs were way down here. They were wondering where their bread was going to come for the next day. And so they trusted God way up here. And God help us, God provide for us. This is the way their scales were balanced. But in the church at Corinth, they had so many physical needs that they became so complacent, their concerns spiritually were down here. And St. Paul says, you know, if you do what you are called to do as Christians, and you lower your physical comfortability so the other side can have some physical comfortability, you have fairness, you have balance in the body of Christ. And that is the way it's supposed to be. Balance. One should not have more. One should not have less. Just like in the Old Testament, when they went out to get manna, those who had gathered more did not have enough. Didn't have any, I mean, were not short, and those that didn't get too many, they never lacked either. Balance in the manna. Balance in the manna, even in the church today. Stewardship Sundays give us an opportunity to do two things. Give us an opportunity to reflect where our heart is. Do a heart check. But it also gives us an opportunity to carry out that balance and to desire to give and to share in the honor. Honor, not obligation. To help those in need. Back then in Paul's day, it was the saints in Jerusalem. Back in our time today, it can be anyone you know who is struggling. Not necessarily talking about the church here. Talking about our neighbor. And making sure that we, by the grace of God, have a balance among them. In his name. Amen. Amen. Now may the peace of God surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds.